verses 29 through 39. I invite you to follow along with me as we hear a word from the Lord. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever, and immediately they told him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she served them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered about the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And in the morning, a great while before day, he rose and went out to a lonely place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him pursued him, and they found him, and they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We are um, in the uh, third week of a sermon series that um, we've called God's Calling, where we're focusing on the scripture passages in the um, prophets and in the Gospel of Mark that focus on Jesus calling us to be disciples and what that looks like. So uh, this week is our um, third uh, passage in Mark. Jesus, if you remember two weeks ago, we talked about him calling the disciples uh, by the Sea of Galilee. And then last week he was teaching in the a synagogue in Capernaum. And this week we have him going to the house of Simon's mother-in-law. I, I could tell you a lot of mother-in-law jokes, but I decided not to. So I want extra points for that. I had some really good ones too. Instead, we're going to situate ourselves again and look at some pictures um, of Simon's mother-in-law house and Capernaum. So uh, if you remember last week, I showed you the pictures of the um, synagogue, the top part, which was um, from the Byzantine period, and the very um, bottom foundation rocks uh, are dated to the first century. This building is right next to the synagogue, and uh, it's believed to be the house of Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And there's a couple of things, uh, reasons why we believe it to be so. The first is that again in the ruins you can see ruins of a first century house and then on top of that are the remains of a church from the fourth and fifth century. So there has always been somebody there claiming that it was Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house. There are other sites like um, where um, they have the garden tomb. There are two different sites that people um, talk about it being and, and uh, historians and archaeologists always go with one where people have been there the longest. And th that's the case with this spot. So if you look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk over here and show you. I should have a pointer stick. If you look, you see these rocks are different from these down here. So this is the first century floor, and built on top of it is the fourth century um, church. So if you go to the next slide. So on top of those remains, they have built an octagonal Catholic church, the Franciscans, and that's the, um, the church that you see right there. Will you go to the next one? I think this is a view from inside the church. So what they did was super smart. They built this glass piece right here in the middle where you can look down into the ruins of the um, church and uh, Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house. So you go to the next slide, I think is... Oh, so that's the synagogue that we showed last week. So you can see how close Simon Peter's uh, mother-in-law's house was to the synagogue. Excuse me. <clears throat> can you go to the next one? And this is another view from inside. It's a beautiful church. On the other side of the windows, you see the Sea of Galilee pictures that I showed you last week. Go one more. So that's a view from the, um, the glass down inside the remains where you can see the floor of Simon Peter's house and then the walls from the 4th century church. See, how many more did I put in? That's another view of down in the rocks. Can you go again? Okay, so this, you see this floor right here? If you were up really close, you'd be able to see that they're mosaic stones, and that's the floor from the fourth century church. So you can see the difference between where they built. This is the first century floor, and that's the um, floor from the fourth century, the mosaics that they would have been walking on. 
And I think that's probably all of them. So there's another one of the one we saw from the beginning. So we're situated. We're in Galilee still at Capernaum, the same city that we were in last week. And Capernaum is one of the cities um, that goes around the Sea of Galilee. Remember, the um, Galilee is a region, not a city. So um, Peter, uh, Jesus starts calling the disciples around the Sea of Galilee. He goes to Capernaum and is in the synagogue. And now we're at Simon Peter's house. So, it it continues right where we left off last week. Jesus had been teaching in the synagogue when a man entered who was possessed by demons, and Jesus healed him from those demons. And now here in Mark's gospel, we have another healing. They've left the synagogue and walked over to Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house. She had a fever, and they told him at once, and he healed her. Did anybody notice Mark's favorite word in the gospel that we heard twice? Does anybody remember what it is, Mark's favorite word? Immediately, immediately he left the synagogue. Immediately they shared that Simon Peter's mother-in-law was sick and immediately Jesus healed her. She had a fever. They told him at once he healed her. And then notice her response. It is to immediately begin serving them. From one sentence to the next, Jesus heals her and she begins serving them. She was restored to her community and to wholeness, and so her healing demanded a response from her. Now, let me tell you here that the word that's translated as serve, the Greek word, is the same word that Jesus uses to describe himself as the one who comes to serve. And it's also the same word used when the angels are waiting on Jesus in the wilderness. It's the same word all three times. That tells us that this example of serving embodies the ideal of discipleship as service to others, which was what Jesus was trying to get people, the disciples and those around him to understand. It was because of the mother-in-law's encounter with Jesus that she responded with immediate discipleship. So Jesus heals her, and then he says he begins to heal more people that they are brought to him, people who are in need of healing and who have demons, and it had to be a long and exhausting day for him. So the next morning, it says very early in the morning, he went to a deserted place or a quiet place, and there he prays. But he wasn't there for very long before the passage tells us that the disciples hunted for him. I think in the version we read it said pursue. The word is actually hunted for him. They found him and said to him, everyone is searching for you. As if to say, there's more for you to do. Why are you out here? There are people waiting for you. But his answer to them is, come on, we need to go to the neighboring towns. We have to leave this place and go to the next town so that I may proclaim the message, for that is what I came out to do. And so they go. The disciples had one idea of what Jesus needed to do, of how the day should go, of what it would look like, of who Jesus would be speaking to and healing. They probably wanted to take him back to Capernaum, back to where they're comfortable to continue the amazing work of healing and teaching right here at home. But Jesus has another idea, and he makes them leave. So let's switch for just a minute, leave our gospel lesson where it is, and look for a couple minutes at our Old Testament lesson. Our Old Testament lesson that Rob read is from Isaiah chapter 40, and this is normally a passage that we use a lot at funerals. It's one of my favorite passages from Isaiah. It comes from a time period during Israel's history known as the Babylonian exile. The Israelites had been defeated by the Babylonians. Their holy city had been destroyed. They had been taken from their homeland, and in this time and place comes the prophet Isaiah, who calls out for them to remember the promises of their creator. This passage begins with a set of rhetorical questions that we hear twice and big sweeping declarations about who God is and what God has done compared to what we have done. I love the way that he words it. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. It is he who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in. It is he who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? 
Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling all of them by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power. Not one is missing. And then Isaiah repeats those questions just a couple verses later. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. When I read this passage at funerals, I always wonder how many thousands of people through the centuries have heard these words and taken those promises literally and found that to wait upon the Lord does that very thing. It enables us to be lifted up by God, to be given strength and purpose and power in our lives. But it all hinges on that one word, wait. That's probably one of the hardest words to learn in the English language, not to speak, but to do, especially for young. Wait. Let God work. The Hebrew word that's used there is the same Hebrew word that's used for twisting, like making a rope, you twist it. So waiting in this case isn't a passive state, but one of tension as you are being worked on. It also means to expect, to gather, to look patiently, to tarry, to bind together. It has a note of expectation about it, that when you are waiting, you are expecting God to work, that we wait in expectation that God will move in our lives. It takes time. You cannot have it overnight, but they that wait upon the Lord shall find their own strength renewed. They shall find their spirit mounting up like the eagle in its flight, their souls able to run the gamut of emotions. They shall never be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Now, I've never seen an eagle in flight in person in real life, but I've seen it in movies, and I've read others' descriptions of it, of watching one from above, and it always has fascinated me. The eagle seems to rise effortlessly. I will leave that out next time. It doesn't seem to move its wings at all if you watch it. They ride the thermals that bear it aloft. I read somewhere that without at least some level of wind or air current, that eagles can barely fly at all because they're not designed to flap and flutter like other birds do to gain wing. So in waiting on the Lord, we are carried ourselves, lifted in a way that our own frantic flapping or planning or telling God what to do will never achieve. Instead of wearying ourselves and those around us, Isaiah's words encourage us to look at the evidence of God's care in creation and know that our own struggles are noted by the same one who counts each star and checks that they are all in their proper place. It is that creator who gives us hope or lifts us up, who gives us peace in the midst of a feeling of chaos. That verse, Isaiah 40, chapter 40, verse 31, is a scripture that is a great comfort to many people. It is a great hope to feel that God can lift us up on eagles' wings. I love the idea of being able to soar above it all, of being the swift and strong eagle with the bird's eye view of all of the grasshoppers below. But I think that if we skip straight from our passage to verse 31, that we are missing a lot of the point of what Isaiah is saying. I think we have to back up to verse 22 and remember that so much of our lives are lived with the grasshoppers. In describing the greatness of our creator, Isaiah starts the passage off by comparing us, the people that live on the earth that God has created, to the small leafhoppers who are more prey than predator. Isaiah has such a gift for metaphor, and I I wonder sometimes if he carefully chose the grasshopper to contrast it with the eagle, or if really any small insect or rodent would do for his literary purposes. I have a couple I could offer as a suggestion. Uh, Some of you will remember a story I told of um, our first year in Indiana. Dwight and I were serving three small churches, and we lived um, right in Hurricane Alley. 
And I am scared to death of hurricanes. They really scare me. Or not hurricanes, tornadoes. I apologize. We were in Tornado Alley. I'm also scared of hurricanes, but tornadoes more. So, um, so because I was scared, we put our, our um, bedroom in the basement of the house. And um, one morning, I woke up early and felt like a scratching on my chin. And I thought just the covers had moved. So I went to, you know, to move them down and discovered that it was a grasshopper this big on my face. I am not exaggerating at all. This is not a fish story. The grasshopper was literally that big. And I screamed. And I made Dwight get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and carry our mattresses upstairs. And we never slept in the basement again. <laughs> I don't like grasshoppers. But I want to talk about the grasshopper for a few minutes. Even if I don't want to eat them, I will be the first to admit that grasshoppers have gotten a little bit of a bad rap. In Aesop's fable, they are the lazy, playful bug that has nothing for the winter and has to beg the industrious ant for food and shelter. If you've ever seen the um, children's movie A Bug's Life, the grasshoppers in that movie are the evil ones. They torment the ants like street gangs. So I think humans generally have a negative view of the grasshopper as a pest that can eat us out of our spot on the food chain. There's an author who wrote about uh, an Iowa summer when you walked through the pasture, he said, each step would cause a ripple of life of grasshoppers that surged nearly 10 feet away as the mobs of grasshoppers leapt out of your way. They ate everything, he said, the corn, the alfalfa, even the tomatoes and the zucchini. So certainly grasshoppers can be a nuisance. But there are good things about grasshoppers as well, I discovered. They have wings too, just like eagles. They can't soar like eagles do, but they can leap 20 times more than their own body length, which means that one could leap really, really far. For a human, such a feat would be a flying leap of 40 yards, which would revolutionize football and basketball and baseball if we could land with the same grace as a grasshopper does. Grasshoppers are one of the most successful species on the planet. There are 18,000 different varieties of grasshoppers. Whose job is it to count stuff like that? They come in a variety of colors. The one that was on my chin that morning was a very ugly brown color. Apparently, the brighter colors of grasshoppers warn birds that they are not good to eat, that they're poisonous. I can also attest that they're not very good to eat. Now, how many of you grew up with the TV show um, called Kung Fu? Anybody remember watching that? Good, thank you for admitting. I didn't watch it, but I read a little bit about it this week. If, for those of you who didn't watch it, um, it had a character named David Carradine and the um, uh, actor named David Carradine, and the weekly drama featured a Chinese monk who had immigrated to the U.S. in the latter part of the 19th century. And he passed from town to town, spreading Zen wisdom and kicking the snot out of all the town bullies. And each episode would flash back to his memories as a boy growing up in the monastery, where before delivering a pearl of wisdom, his master would affectionately call him Grasshopper. There's something about grasshoppers that speaks of playful adolescents trying to come into maturity. They look like their tongue is perpetually sticking out. When you look at them, they're quick to leap away and hide in the grass. And um, have that, they have that built-in fiddle. If you see them in cartoons, they're always fiddling on their arms. So grasshopper seems like an excellent name for a spiritual novice. But here's why I think Isaiah chose the grasshopper to represent humanity. Grasshoppers not only have wings, though they are much smaller than eagles' wings, they also have five eyes. Part of their adaptability and survival comes from their ability to see everything around them in a great panorama. It is that ability to see the wide horizon that can take us beyond being just a spiritual novice. If we only see the next blade of grass in front of us, we will not grow and thrive. As long as we remain down in the grass, content to only look in front of us, we quickly become weighed down by the trivial, annoyed by the attitudes of other people, caught up in our own selfish struggles, wondering why the grass doesn't taste better, or worried that we're going to run out of grass altogether. So when I read this passage from Isaiah now, I hear him saying to us, look, grasshopper, have you not seen, have you not heard? Look around you at the big world. Behind it all is your creator who has the expansive power of life. The power to control the ocean, the power to number the stars and keep them in place, a power that can make a small grasshopper soar like an eagle. 
In faith, it is this capacity to look at the vast expanse of the world with a sense of awe and wonder that begins to lift us to new heights. Seeing things with the eyes of amazement, seeing ourselves in the context of being part of God's majestic creation gives our faith that wind beneath our wings to soar. I wonder what would have changed for the disciples in Mark's gospel if they had seen like that, seen more than just one blade of grass in front of them, more than just the next healing or teaching. Maybe instead of hunting for Jesus to bring him back to Capernaum, they would have sat and prayed with him, preparing themselves for what was to come. Maybe they would have waited for God's plan to unfold with a little more patience and a little less stress. So that's my prayer for us this day. May the words in Isaiah remind us of the beauty and power of our creator. May the words of Mark remind us that our response to an encounter with Christ should be a life of serving Christ and his community. And may we all live to, learn to live with grasshopper eyes and eagle wings. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.